This is such a cute poem because I think it really beautifully captures the child's voice and explores that theme of childhood, specifically the way in which children process the world around them and successfully or unsuccessfully process the adult world. In particular, it's how they process in this poem the adult concept of time. And the reason I'm saying adult concept is like, you know, it, it is a human construct to a degree. I mean, I don't know, there's so, probably someone who really knows physics that's gonna start commenting below about dimensions and all that kind of stuff. But the reason it's called half past two is that idea of like, we defined that particular chunk of the day and named it half past two rather than flibbity gibbet for example so this poem is all about yes childhood but also the way we use time to order and control the world around us and that being a sort of negative thing in a way for children and how it takes away some of their freedom and creativity and wonder now i realized too late that i'd forgot to include the title of this poem when i copied the poem over but obviously that doesn't matter, you know the name of the poem that you have looked up the video for, Half Past Two. So I want to start by just analysing that title. And as I mentioned before, Half Past Two represents time. And time in turn in this poem is a symbol of like the way we control and order our lives and the world around us. And because this is the title of the poem, it symbolises the way in which time defines this child. Arguably the specific time is reflective of the way this memory is also really sort of powerful and strong to him and has meant and been a very significant memory for him because I think you could also say less of a focus but for sure this is also a poem exploring memory in that this is a time in the past that the child is remembering back on and how you know, what is it that is significant in this memory? What is significant about this memory? But more so, I think it's about the way time defines this child's life and how adults shape the structure of his life through time. That being said, when you're writing an essay, you cannot prove all of that argument just by looking at the title. I would strongly recommend analysing something in the main body of the poem and then talking about how the title supports and reinforces that idea because the title just on its own when you're coming to the poem fresh doesn't create any of that meaning. It only gains that meaning once you've read the poem, understood the things actually going on in the main body of it. Before we go into the specific lines of the poem, we want to talk about the style that this poem is written in the voice of this poem and it is called free indirect discourse now in free indirect discourse it's like a sort of blend of third person narrative style and first person narrative style whereby you have the third person he they she pronouns because the narrator is not in the story and yet you also have the thoughts feelings of the character so you're still able to have a little bit of that closeness and intimacy and understanding while still having the third person sort of detachment that makes it feel more like a story is really classically used in children's stories and i think that's why it is used here because if we think about the opening of the poem once upon a that is mimicking the style of fairy tales and reflects that our child is having to process this memory and this um, experience through things that he does understand to help process the things he doesn't understand so he's telling it like the many stories that he's heard before. What is also interesting about this opening line though is you have a bit of juxtaposition because it's once upon a school time. While once upon a has connotations um, of you know magic and fantasy, imagination, because it is the classic opening of a fairy tale, school time has much more connotations of rules order, formality, authority, and therefore the juxtaposition between the two is a little bit jarring and reflects that clash that it can exist in a child's life between the sort of rules and order and also their imagination and creativity as well. So just within the very opening line, our poet has already foregrounded that key idea of how 
childhood is a time of wonder and imagination, but also rules order from the authority of adults. Another thing that this does is really show the innocence of the child, and that's something we're going to see repeatedly done throughout this poem including in the next line, he did something very wrong. The way that the poet uses capitalization in this poem is really clever because the capitalization is used to show how something is really like significant and important to the child. And yet at the same time, the indefinite pronoun of something shows his innocence because it's like, he knows there's a big deal here. He knows this is important and significant, but he can't understand why. So it's sim a simultaneous understanding and lack of understanding that is very classic of children. Now our next line of the parenthesis, I forget what it was. I'm gonna come back to that. And I'm gonna come back to it at the end because I think there's actually an interpretation you can have of this poem of who is the speaker of this poem that links to the theme of memory. But to be able to properly explain that idea, I need more stuff that's gonna come later. So we're gonna come back to this, I forget what it was line. Don't worry, I'm not ignoring it. Instead though, I wanna talk about, again, the use of capitalization in the next stanza on she. Obviously in the English language, the pronoun she uh, doesn't need to be capitalized. And therefore the capitalization is again about showing the significance of something and that this child knows it is important. In this case, important because of authority. We as the reader of this poem sort of assume the she is a teacher because we've been told it's school time and this is someone who can tell the child what to do. So the she is likely a teacher and therefore uh, symbolizes the authority over a child. We're then told that being cross, she'd forgotten she hadn't taught him time and he was too scared of being wicked to remind her. So this is kind of a smaller point, but I think it's worth highlighting some of the ways in which UA Fanthorpe creates our childlike voice. One of the ways is it's largely monosyllabic. That just means words with one syllable. It's also childlike lexis. That means words that kids will typically use that we as adults know, but don't tend to use. So, you know, tummy instead of stomach, cross instead of angry, wicked instead of misbehaving or whatever. And the creation of this childlike voice is really important in again conveying that innocence um, and I think a little bit of vulnerability of um, children generally as well, which is important when we consider what's actually happening in the poem and the fact that he doesn't understand the world around him. What's also important to note in this stanza is we've again got the capitalization of time having that same effect of showing its importance, its significance. So it's like, again, understanding and lack of understanding, our child knows time is important, but doesn't understand time. And the next line of the next stanza really embodies that he knew a lot of time. Now, first of all, there is an irony in him saying he knew because of course that conveys a sense of understanding um, that he thinks he has but doesn't actually as reflected in the words that follow. So the writer talks about getting up time, time you're off time, time to go home now time, TV time, time for my kiss time, that was grand time. All of these are what we would call compound nouns. However, they are compound nouns that the child has made up. So that shows the way that they have to process time is by naming it by their experiences. They don't have half past two or anything like that. They name it by what am I doing at that time? It's also interesting that so many, despite being made up by the child, they still have the language of adults. So time you were off time, is like an adult has said to him or others, oh, it's time we were off. Or an adult has come into his bedroom and said, it's time to get up. An adult has said, it's time to go home, etc. So 
at the, it, it's a really interesting impact in simultaneously showing the creative way in which a child tries to process the world around them, but also the huge influence that adults have on that processing as well. What's also really sweet is the way it says all the important times he knew. Again, a bit of irony there, because as the reader we know those aren't especially important times. So it also I guess shows the sort of subjectivity of time, because to the child that is really important time. Time with gran, time for the kiss, time for bed, those are the important times of their day, even though we may view it differently. And we have this again juxtaposition between what the child defines as important versus the half past two and his suggestion that that is not important which of course for an adult it's the other way around you know knowing half past two is the important one rather than getting up time etc etc so it really shows our innocence of a child who doesn't understand the world fully and is trying to process the things around them. What's interesting in the next stanza is again we see a way in which the child goes about processing that world and what the child does is essentially applies something they are familiar with to something they are unfamiliar with and we've seen them do that before. We've seen them do that with the once upon her and the way that they tell stories being you know how fairy tales also start. We see that with the getting up time, time you were off time, where they are using a familiar experience to order the concept of time that they don't understand. Here it's looking at time via a clock. So the way in which this child processes the clock, which again is a symbol of time in the way in which we order time through objects, is by using a semantic field of humans because he doesn't know about time itself so he essentially has to use the language of humans instead. So we've got the little eyes, the long legs and not clicking its language. So he is applying descriptors of people to the clock. The little eyes I assume are like the numbers going round it, uh, we're of course talking about an analogue clock here rather than a digital, and then the long legs are the hands of the clock that are going round its language being understanding time. So this is just another example of the actually quite imaginative way that children process what they do not understand in the world around them. And as I've already said, it's about applying the familiar to the unfamiliar. Now at this next bit of the poem, I would argue we have a bit of a volta. It's not a massive drastic volta, but I would say the turn is that up to this point, our child has been defined by time. So the punishment he's experiencing is very much linked to time. Um, you know, he has to be in this room till half past two and he's reflected on what he does and doesn't understand about time. Then when we get to this point of the poem, all of a sudden he is outside of time because he's been left alone in this room not knowing what half past two means and actually instead of being a punishment, his detention becomes a form of liberation from this control. And we see that with the prepositional phrases beyond and out of reach, and what he's beyond and out of reach of are time fours and once upon her. So the time fours and once upon her, they symbolize obviously time that is controlled, and therefore the prepositional phrases place him outside of that, place him outside of their control. And then what's interesting is it then says, I knew he'd escaped forever. So of course, if you're saying that someone has escaped something, it denotes that they were previously trapped in some way. And therefore, that's why I think that this is actually presented as being, it's a good thing that he's getting to get away from time. He has managed to escape the confinements of time. Like I said before, this might be a punishment, but it's not feeling that way to him. And then what we have in the next stanza is an exploration of what happens when you are freed from time. And it says, he'd escaped forever into the smell of old chrysanthemums on her desk, into the silent noise his hangnail made, into the air outside the window, into ever. The sensory language in this stanza of smell, uh, noise and sort of touch of air 
shows that he's really reconnecting with the world around him. When you're not so focused on the abstract concept like time, you can focus much more on the concrete sensations that are going on around you. I'd also say that the anaphora in this stanza with the into, 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 is important in slowing down the pace of the poem. When you're reconnecting with the world around you, you sort of take a bit more time and slow down with things. This turn, however, is very brief because our teacher comes back. Now, something that is hopefully presented on your version of the poem, but again, I've just realized it's not presented on mine, is the fact that our teacher's dialogue is all in bold in the original poem. It's all in bold. That is important because again, it shows the significance. So I think part of why UA Fanthorpe breaks the grammar rules and doesn't use speech marks is because it again reflects our child's understanding and lack of understanding. The bold indicates they know that this person is important, what they have to say is important. The lack of speech marks, they don't know the rules of the English language yet, certainly not the written English language yet. There's also something quite interesting about the juxtaposition of this dialogue from this teacher and then our internal narrative we've had from our child up to this point. Because for our child, it's all been about the importance of this moment. You know, half past two was the title of the poem. The most of the poem up to this point has just been reflecting on what is half past two. He doesn't know what half past two is. And that's been a big definer for him. And yet, this I forgot all about you. This is not a big deal to our teacher at all. This moment is not a big deal to our teacher in the way that it is to the child. Another example of the ways in which adults and children processing the world differently. What is also interesting about her dialogue is that the sort of imperative command she gives him is time-centered. Run along or you'll be late. So that really, that dialogue is really symbolizing his return to the sort of status quo of the adult world and the importance of time everywhere because that is what is sort of defining why he needs to behave in a certain way. You need to get going or you'll be late and the late part is what really matters. We then have this metaphor, uh, it's a specific type of metaphor called shramomorphism and that is where she slotted him back in. That represents the return to order and control. He's been taken out of our Volta moment of uh, being beyond and out of reach of time and he is very much back into it, slotted him back into school time, home time. And this listing of our compound nouns, school time, tea time, next time, no time for that, now time, reflects again what I was saying about the other compound nouns earlier in the poem about how adults very much define his uh, life, define the way he moves in the world. I think that's particularly shown in our last compound noun, no time for that now. So it's within that way of him processing time is a moment, is an experience in which, you know, as clearly suggested, he has wanted to do something and an adult has said no. Reflecting that authority of adults, reflecting that control, that limitation that adults place on children. Things have very much gone back to the way they were before. That being said, this moment still did, still has a lasting impact on him in terms of memory. He never forgot how once by not knowing time, he escaped into the clockless land forever where time hides tickless waiting to be born. This metaphor at the end here is really interesting. So you've got this clockless land that symbolizes a space obviously where uh, it is free of the control of time. But I think by calling it a land, it creates uh, connotations of fantasy, magic, mystery, travel, exploration, that's very much in keeping with a child's imagination, as does the personification of time hiding. That thing I've been saying of a child processing the unfamiliar with the familiar, 
they process not understanding time as time hiding from them. So it's something they know is there, but they can't see it. And I think that adds to, similar to the clockless land, it adds that mystery secrecy around it. The waiting to be born is the same concept. It's their way of describing the act of learning what something is. You've also got within this uh, little phrase here, time hides tickless. I think you have got a very uh, subtle, gentle sibilance that just adds a little bit of hushed tones. Time hides tickless. That is again part of adding to the secrecy and mystery of it all, this concept that he doesn't fully understand. And then the born is using another human experience to try and process a concrete human experience, the act of being physically born, to try and understand the concept of understanding time. So it's a repeated pattern that we have throughout this poem of concrete imagery like um, eyes and legs, TV time, time for my kiss time, being used to process and understand this abstract concept of time. Two final things I wanna cover. One is a sort of structural point. This poem is in tercets. On the other hand, it is also in free verse. The reason I think that is important is because it reflects what we've been saying about the poem the whole way through. The tercets are the order and control, the regularity that this child experiences in their lives as an consequence of the influence of adults. But the free verse with no rhythm or rhyme is more of like a freedom, a, a freedom of expression and creativity, not having to follow any rules or anything like that. And so reflects that aspect of childhood. And so it's the combination of the two reflecting what exists for a child. There is some control, but there is also some freedom as well. I also told you I was going to come back to this parenthesis about the I forget what it was to ask that question, who is the speaker of this poem? The use of that first person in the parenthesis combined with the free and direct discourse, which means we knew what the child was thinking all the time, makes me think that the speaker of the poem is this child, except perhaps they are not a child anymore. The reason I say that is the whole thing gives the feel to me of someone narrating a story about a key moment of their lives, perhaps to another child, and that's why they use the very childlike Lexis, that's why they use the familiar concept like once upon her. But there's just something to me very profound and adult about phrases like he never forgot. If this happened to you last Tuesday, you don't use a phrase he never forgot. He never forgot, that adverb of never implies such a significance and importance of this memory to him that it's lasted with him for a long time. So if you ask me, the speaker of this poem is the child of the poem, now as an adult, telling it back with the childlike voice. And so on the theme of memory, we see how powerful key little moments that where nothing necessarily massive happens, like this is, there's no big dramatic event here, and yet they can have a really profound impact on us. And in this case, it's the profound impact of getting to experience a sort of freedom from adult authority and control for, I mean, we obviously don't know how long it was exactly, but not very long, given that the child was just forgotten about in a detention.